So first of all, I want to introduce myself. My name is Nathan Rono. I'm an incoming level five student. So hope it will be an interactive session. Okay. So number one, this is how the questions will look like. A 50 year old female is, ex is being evaluated for insidious onset of mood disorder and unexplained weight gain over the last four months. The thyroid stimulating hormone level is found to be high. What is the most likely diagnosis? Then B, list five additional information you'd obtain in the history that would support the diagnosis. C, list five signs you look for in the physical examination to support the diagnosis of A above. D, list four investigations you'd carry out and the expected findings that would support the diagnosis in A above. So what is the most likely diagnosis? You can type on the chat. Hypothyroidism, primary hypothyroidism, 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 yes. So we haven't been given the levels of T3 and T4, but from the TSH, it's found to be high. We know that this is primary, this is hypothyroidism. So there's no need of saying primary, secondary, or tertiary. Hypothyroidism will do, okay? So hypothyroidism. Good. List five additional information you will obtain in the history that would support the diagnosis. So we already have mood disorder and unexplained weight gain over four months. Okay, so this is a patient with hypothyroidism. How do you clock a patient with hypothyroidism? Okay, answers. Menses history, yes. So what do you expect in menses history? They'll be irregular, good. Okay, uh -huh. another answer. Okay, one thing, um, menses history, from the question, this is a 50-year-old female. We expect her to be to have reached menopause, but um, for the menses history, it's relevant since we know that hypothyroidism presents with abnormal menstruation, isn't it? Family history, okay, yes. So you're going to ask if there's hypothyroidism in the family, okay. For Hashimoto's, yes. So Hashimoto's is the most common cause of hypothyroidism. So we're going to ask if there's a family history. General body temperature feeling. Should be feeling cold generally, yes. So how to ask that is very important. We usually ask them at room temperature, what do you usually feel? So for hypothyroidism, we expect is it heat intolerance or cold intolerance? Cold intolerance, good. So they'll tell you at room temperature, they're feeling really, really cold. And when they're feeling cold, no one else is feeling cold, okay? For heat intolerance, they'll tell you they're feeling very hot when no one else is feeling hot. Drug use, you good. So you ask medication history. Are they taking amiodarone? Are they taking lithium? Okay, because those have been seen to cause hypothyroidism. We have symptoms like hair loss and constipation. Yes, so you're going to ask them their bowel habits. Have they passed stool in the last three days? Fatigue, yes. So you have to ask the B symptoms. Do they have loss of appetite? Do they have fatigue? Good. 
skin changes, yes. So in hypothyroidism, you expect them to have dry, cool skin. Okay, and they'll also have decreased sweating. General sluggishness in daily activity, lethargy, yes. So that's the fatigue I was saying. Then they'll also have muscle weakness. Okay. Any prior viral infections? So the patient won't tell you that. So maybe you have to explain to them, have you had a cold in the recent past? Because they can't know if they had any viral infection or a specific infection, yes. Okay, good. So at least we have seen how to ask those questions. They've said five. We have mentioned at least 10. Okay. So you go system by system to know what questions to ask. Diet change? Yes. Okay. We have already been told it's unexplained um, weight gain. So we know that it is unrelated to the diet. Okay. You can ask about another one we forgot is their libido. Okay. Has it increased or decreased? We expect it to decrease. Okay. So at least you have done for all the systems. Where do they live? Yes. So where do they live? How is it relevant to hypothyroidism? So iron deficiency in certain areas, good. So in Kenya, most relevant patients who come from the Mount Kenya region or the central region usually have iron deficiency. Then a history of any other autoimmune disease, okay, such like diabetes mellitus, SLE, pernicious anemia. Good, at least you have rolled out the symptoms and the risk factors. But we go to see at least five signs you would look for in the physical examination to support the diagnosis in A above. Okay, I want answers. Answers in the chat. I've seen a question, why would you ask about viral infections? So in the causes of hypothyroidism, viral infections has been linked to be a risk factor of a certain cause of hypothyroidism. Specifically, it's called the Quevan. It's uh, one of the causes of primary hypothyroidism. You can go check that out. Okay. So periobital edema. Good, so you're going to see periobital edema. Hair loss at the end of the eyebrows, yes. Non-pitting edema, good. It has a name. We call it low limb edema, yes. The non-pitting edema, we have, there's a name we call it. Specific to hypothyroidism, mixed edema, very good. Very good. So mixed edema basically is swelling and thickening of the skin. Pretibial myxedema, no, that is found in hyperthyroidism rather than hypothyroidism. Okay. Pretibial myxedema means you only have edema at the front part of the, of the tibia. That's why it's called pretibial myxedema. But for this one, we have, it's usually generalized non-pitting edema. So we call it myxedema. Good. Temperature of extremities. Okay, yes. So to see if there is cool, dry skin. Good. Hoarse voice. Um, okay, depends. Now this one, if they have a goiter, is when the goiter will 
press on the structures around the neck. So we have the trachea, we have the esophagus, we have the larynx, the pharynx. So they'll tell you maybe they have a hoarse voice, they have difficulty swallowing, difficulty breathing, okay? But now that depends if they have a goiter. So that one you have to mention. And then we have bradycardia. Um, so they've asked in the physical examination, so how would bradycardia manifest itself? Low pulse. Slow pulse rate, yes. So that's what you expect on physical examination. Uh -huh. Another one. Comment on their sweating. Will it be increased or decreased? And when you do a GIT exam, the number of bowel sounds, will it be increased or decreased? Bowel sounds will be decreased, isn't it? Sweating will also be decreased. Good. So we have said at least five. There's one more CNS finding. Comment on their deep tunnel reflexes. Will it be increased or decreased? Decreased, good. So they'll have delayed deep tendon reflexes, good. Number D, list four investigations you would carry out and the expected findings that would support the diagnosis. Okay, so we have already done TSH. So what is the first one we do? Under thyroid function test. T3, T4 levels, good. So what do we expect, increased or decreased? decreased so we'll have reduced free t3 t4 levels okay another test i want four tpo do you mean antibody anti tpo yes so yes, the antibodies. So they're called antithyroid antibodies. We have antithyroxidase antibodies and TPO, anti-TPO, good. Um, HB, so I usually say you just do complete blood count. So you'll see low HB. So there's usually mild anemia in hypothyroidism. Mm hmm Ultrasound, yes. So you have to do ultrasound of the neck in case there's a goiter. Yes. So if you find a goiter, what else do you do? The three tests, if you find a goiter, you cannot even a goiter, let's say a swelling, a mass on the neck. Fine needle aspiration, yes, and biopsy. Good. So a thyroid biopsy, you start with ultrasound then, uh, fine needle aspiration then, a biopsy to check if it's malignant. Then we have lipid profile, good. What do you expect on lipid profile? So you say the test and what do you expect? Hypercholesterolemia. Yes, so, or you can say low LDL, sorry, high LDL levels. There's another one you guys are forgetting. You have to do inflammatory markers. So ESR and calcitonin or CRP, yes. F fasting blood sugar. So why do we do fasting blood sugar in a patient you suspect has Hypothyroidism.
I set up scan for iodine uptake. Yes, you can do that. And now these tests are not routinely done. These tests are not routinely done. So we, we do the baseline test first, and then we do FNA ultrasound. Uh, can we do fasting blood sugar to see any underlying DM? So in your priority answers, I feel, you know, yes, um you can you can mention it but mention it at the bottom okay so you have to start with the primary test that you do for a patient with hypothyroidism then you can think of the other so what are the baseline tests so the baseline tests are the complete blood count uecs urea electrolytes and creatinine okay lipid profile triple serology, those are the baseline tests that we do for almost any disease. Uh, someone has asked, sorry, why are we doing lipid profile and the patient has obviously gained weight? So in hypothyroidism, they usually have an issue with their lipid metabolism. So we usually check for the levels of cholesterol so that we start them on on uh, certain drugs to lower the cholesterol. Why do we do UECs in hypothyroidism? So similar to that, a specific pattern is, in acute hypothyroidism, we expect hyponatremia. So that's why we do UECs. Okay. Any question on this? I think we have exhausted the answers. If you are unable to write down, no worries, I'm going to share the recording later so you can write it down. Okay, question two. A 20 year old male presents with generalized body swelling for four months. He has been in good health previously. His urine output is normal and he has no shortness of breath. His blood pressure is 116 over 65 millimeters mercury. Urinalysis reveals protein four plus. No casts, no red blood cells. What is the most likely diagnosis? Yes, so answers have already started flowing. Nephrotic syndrome, good. This is obviously nephrotic syndrome. Okay. State four clinical stroke laboratory features that characterize this condition. So I want you guys to start with the clinical, then the laboratory. So, so clinical features of nephrotic syndrome that have not been mentioned in the question. Mm -hmm. They're quite a lot, so answers should be flowing. Recurrent infections. Mm -hmm. So... Okay, yes. I mean, on theory, yes. But what is the clinical feature? So I want to take that as an answer. Hypercoagulability, okay, yes. But what is the clinical feature? Fatty casts in urine. Okay. Uh, I prefer you say frothy urine. Casts are what you'll see on the lab. I'm talking about the... Clinical feature. 
diarrhea, vomiting, cough, dysuria for infection. Yeah, when they usually say recurrent infection, I get your reasoning because these are people who lose immunoglobulins in blood. So if you had to say recurrent infections, you can say maybe um, recurrent infections, for example, pneumonias, where they can present with difficulty in breathing, chest pain uh, that increases in on, on inspiration, something like that. Just keep talking. The, the lecturer will understand. But if you just say recurrent infections, that's not a clinical feature. Periobital edema. Okay, good. So specific to uh, kidney, a kidney pathology, we know that the periobital edema reduces as the day goes on. So when you lie down, the fluid backs up to the eyes and we know that the eyes have thin skin, so fluid accumulates there. Okay, yes. I'm wondering, you're not, you guys are not giving me signs of fluid overload. Hypercholesterolemia is a lab feature. I'm looking for clinical features. So yes, orthopnea, PND, chest pain, yes. Good. Haven't you already said generalized edema in the vignette? Why are we saying periobital edema? Uh, yeah. So if you have said generalized body swelling, no need to say periobital edema, but that was a good point. Yes, orthopnea, PND. Give me signs of How is there orthopnea and PND if there's no shortness of breath? I'm confused. I don't understand your question. What is orthopnea? Orthopnea is difficult in breathing on lying down. PND is difficult in breathing when sleeping that will wake you up so that you gasp for air, isn't it? So I don't understand your question. So these patients are losing calcium in, in, in urine, isn't it? So you'll have symptoms of hypocalcemia. So tetany, we have tetany, paresthesia, muscle spasm. Is difficulty in breathing and shortness of breath the same thing? It's usually used under, uh, changeably, variably, but DIB is more of a CVS issue where you have you have no issue getting air into your lungs, but the issues with the gaseous exchange. While shortness of breath is most likely have an issue of getting air into your, we call it breathlessness, air into your, your lungs. Then difficulty breathing is all about the gaseous exchange. But during ward rounds, during clacking, you'll see many people use it interchangeably. Another clinical feature is these guys have hypercholesterolemia. So you'll have xanthelasmas and xanthomas, okay? Now for the lab features. How do we define nephrotic syndrome? With a specific lab feature. Proteinuria of how much? Three point five grams per twenty four hour collection of urine. Good. So that was the lab. Another one. I saw someone say hypercholesterolemia. Yes. So on lipid profile, you'll expect increased cholesterol and triglycerides, fatty casts on urine. Yes, so under urine microscopy, you're going to see fatty casts. Good. Another one. What about the albumin le levels? Decreased antithrombin 3. Mm -hmm. But is antithrombin 3 a routine test done in the lab? So low albumin, yes, hypo 
albuminemia, good. And then hypoglobinemia, yes. And then comment on the on the electrolytes, UECs. They'll be deranged, okay? So urea will be deranged, electrolytes will be deranged, and creatinine will be deranged, indicating um, kidney damage. Okay, good. See, list five secondary causes of this condition. There are so many, so, so many. What secondary means is that a pathology outside the kidney caused the nephrotic syndrome. Diabetes mellitus, good. Hepatitis B. Hepatitis C, good. Sickle cell disease, good. Minimal change disease is a primary cause of nephrotic syndrome, not secondary. So, no. Um, SLE, good. Amyloidosis, good. Strep infection, um, no, I think, do you mean post-infectious glomerulonephritis? It causes nephritic syndrome rather than nephrotic syndrome, okay? Medications, yes, so tell me the medications. Heroin use, good. Which are the nephrotoxic drugs you know? Aminoglycosides, NSAIDs, good. So we have mentioned at least 10 from that, that list but you guys are getting correct. Another one to add, you can add malaria, syphilis, okay? Number D, list renal-related investigations that should be done. So the question is very specific to renal-related. There are usually five renal-related investigations. UECs, so, urine, electrolyte, and creatinine. Renal biopsy, yes. 24-hour urine collection, yes. Before you do a biopsy, what do you do? Ultrasound, good, urine ultrasound. So one more, one more you guys are forgetting. It's very, very obvious. How will you know the person has proteinuria? Lipstick, so what do we call it? Urinalysis. So we do urinalysis and microscopy. Good. Next. List five complications that are associated with this condition. Now, here's where you can tell me recurrent infections as a complication. So let's reason, what are they losing and what complication will they get? Okay, so I want to see answers. So they use, they're losing immunoglobulin, so they'll have recurrent infections. Yes. DVT. So I've seen DVT, I've seen TIA, all those. What do we call that? Thromboembolic events. Okay. So why do they have thromboembolic events? Because they're losing antithrombin-3 in urine. So... Um, So they, are, they will be at a hypercoagulable state. Okay, good. Um, protein malnutrition, good, because they are losing significant amount of protein. Yes. Atherosclerosis complications, very good. So hyperlipid, because of hyperlipidemia. Acute kidney injury, yes. And then chronic kidney disease, CKD. 
and then ascites ascites due to loss of albumin uh, i feel like ascites is more of a presentation rather than a complication okay so i want you guys to tell me how do we define aki and how do we define ckd because i remember during our time people are really really confused KD goes definition of AKI and KD goes definition of CKD. Mm -hmm. What is an AKI and what is CKD? There are two measures we use for CKD and two measures for AKI. So CKD is decreased GFR for more than three months. Um, so other than the GFR, what other measure do we use to define CKD? True, the duration is more than three months, but what do we define? What other measure for CKD? Kidney damage, yes. No, creatinine is not used for CKD. Hormonal changes, no. Endocrine function of kidneys affected, no. KDGO, use the KDGO definition. Albuminuria, good. Good. So CKD is defined as progressive damage to the kidney indicated by um, EGFR ratio and albuminuria. So if you go and see, there is a picture on KDGO, how they have uh, damaged the kidney starts from 1, 2, 3A, 3B, 4, and 5. And then albuminuria, we have A1, A2, and A3. Okay. So I was asked during my end of rotation, I went to the nephro ward and I got a patient with CKD and they asked me to define CKD. And that is how you have to explain to them. A1, A2, A3. So go check on that table. And then AKI, how do we define AKI? The two measures we use to define AKI using KDGO. Serum creatinine, good. And the last one? Urine output, good. And then the duration is less than three months. Okay, so don't confuse that. We said CKD is defined by EGFR ratio and albuminuria. AKI is defined by serum creatinine levels and the urine output levels. Those are the criteria that define the stages of AKI. Okay, next. With regards to malaria, name four parasites that cause human malaria. Mm -hmm. This should be easy. Plasmodium falciparum, Plasmodium viva, Plasmodium ovale, and the last one. Plasmodium malariae. Very good. State five clinical features that define severe and complicated malaria in adults. So I want clinical features. Don't give me lab features. Clinical features. So I'd prefer we go systemic so that we don't miss out on something. Okay. So I've seen someone has started with convulsions. So if we were to do CNS, so let's start with CNS since someone has started with convulsions. So give me the CNS symptoms that define complicated and severe malaria. He has started with convulsions. Uh -huh. Another one. CNS. 
CNS features, convulsions, hallucinations, good. Blurry vision. Mm. I mean, for that, you have to give an explanation how to relate that with malaria. But uh, blurry vision, no. Confusion, yes. So we have altered mental status. And then the last one, they usually come in the last one, coma, okay? A coma is also a CNS feature. Okay, I saw someone say splenomegaly, so that's GIT. Let's go to GIT. Any other GIT symptom? Mm -hmm. Hepatomegaly, yes. So usually hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice, yes. Remember these people, what is happening in malaria, they're having hemolysis. So you have to have jaundice. And we are talking about complicated malaria. Nausea, vomiting, yes, yes, yes. Diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, all those. Good. We go to, I saw another symptom someone had mentioned. Fever. Okay. So for these ones, fever. So I'll call it, we can, because fever is usually, it doesn't fall in any symptom. We can call this general symptoms. So what general symptoms will they present with? Fever. Yes. Fever and muscle pain. Okay, that can be in, in under musculoskeleton, but you can also put it here. And then we have extreme fatigue. Extreme fatigue, okay? Usually very, very tired. Chills and rigors, yes. Anorexia, that's also under general. Good. Loss of appetite. Uh -huh. I've seen hematuria, so that's a renal symptom, okay? Give me renal symptoms of severe and complicated malaria. You've started with hematuria. Uh, I mean, if you say black water fever, is that a clinical feature? What is the clinical feature? Because black water fever is the is the general term. It has very many clinical features there. So we're looking for clinical features. And the renal, we have a lot. Since we know malaria causes acute kidney injury. So you have to mention symptoms of acute kidney injury. We have flank pain. Remember, we defined acute kidney injury as urine output. So they'll have one of the criteria was urine, urine output. So they'll have oliguria, hemoglobinuria. Yes. So you'll say Coca-Cola urine or duck urine. Good. Let's go to CVS. CVS symptoms that show severe and complicated malaria. Features of shock. So what are those? Hypotension. Remember the question is asking clinical features. So you have to be very specific on what you're saying. Okay, I, I, I think I, I like your thinking pattern, but we're talking about clinical features. What you will see or from the patient.
postural dizziness. Yeah, that's a feature of hypotension. Shortness of breath, yes. Okay. What about the capillary refill time? Since you have shock, you're losing blood due to hemolysis. What would be the cap refill time? Slow. So what is slow? More than one, more than two, more than three. More than three seconds. Okay. I, uh, respiratory symptoms. Delayed cap refill time. Good. More than three seconds. Respiratory symptoms. So you already gave us shortness of breath. You already give us shortness of breath. Any other one? Rapid breathing, yes. So hypoxia, I mean, that's not a clinical feature, but uh -huh, difficulty in breathing. They'll also have cyanosis. Okay, good. Then under metabolic, we'll have hypoglycemia okay features of pulmonary edema yes then outline five lab criteria that define severe and complicated malaria indicating the threshold level for each criteria so for labs Okay, this is under uh, is it CDC. We use for CDC. Hypoglycemia, yes. So, so you have to tell us, when you tell us hypoglycemia, you tell us the lab level. So hypoglycemia, so how many milligrams? No, let's use... Millimoles per liter. Use millimoles per liter. So 2.2 millimoles per liter, okay? Because in Kenya here, we use millimoles per liter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are so many. Anemia. They'll have anemia. What is the threshold for anemia? Less than five. So less than five is usually in children. In adults, we use less than seven grams per DL. Urea, greater than 20, good. Bilirubin. So I'll give you the features you tell me. So anemia, we have said less than seven. Hypoglycemia, less than 2.2 millimoles per liter. We have acidosis. Usually greater than eight. Good. There's someone who has written them. Bill, thank you, Bill. Acidosis less greater than eight or plasma bicarbonate less than 15. 
Acute kidney injury, creatinine more than three or urea more than 20, good. Parasitemia, greater than 10. So for us, we use greater than 4%, okay? Greater than 4% of infected red blood cells. Hyperbilirubinemia, greater than three. And then, remember these are people who are undergoing um, hemolysis. So reticulocyte count is also important. So if the retic count is greater than 2.5. Okay, good. Stage two malaria prevention strategies. There are so many, so you should be telling me like 10. Sleeping under treated mosquito nets, very good. The word is treated. You just don't say uh, mosquito nets. Chemoprophylaxis. If you're traveling to endemic areas, we use mefloquine and atavacone proguanil, good. Another one, clearing bushes, good. Internal residual spring, draining stagnant waters, slashing bushes, good. Another one that people usually forget, health education. Anywhere you see prevention, you just say health education. You have to educate the public on uh, what malaria, how you can get malaria, how to prevent it, how it is spread. Okay. So that's under health education or community awareness. Early diagnosis is also a prevention mechanism. Spring, like mosquito doom, yeah, all of those. Okay, so this is my last question. And I want to see who knows this. So how do you answer a question when you're told diagnostic workup stroke medical evaluation of a patient? So... Um, I got this question from the questions we have been doing, but it's usually phrased in a different way. So you'll be you'll be given a clinical vignette, then you'll be told evaluate or uh, medically evaluate this patient, or you'll be told what is the diagnostic workup for this patient. So there's a certain way we answer this question. We have I think around five things you have to say five things you just you just don't rush what do you think is the first way we evaluate a patient or diagnostic workup of a patient <laughs> history taking very good so we take a thorough medical history good number two a physical exam so when we say physical exam we mean both general and systemic exam. Good. The next. Investigations. Yes. So in investigations, we have very many investigations. We have laboratory investigations. So which ones are those? You have to mention them. Imaging, yes, we have imaging. Blood work, I'd put that under lab tests because if you say blood work, you know you'll have to say CBCs, uh, UECs, LFTs, TFTs, all those. So I'll put that under labs. There's one more. In fact, there are two more that are in the general category. Do you remember the tests used to do in immunology? immunofluorescent assay, flow cytometry, genetic testing. So those ones are called specialized tests, especially if you're looking for certain markers or things like that. So I'd call those specialized tests. And then microbiology, you have to culture. Okay. After that, what do you do next? You have done your investigations. So you've taken a thorough history, done a proper physical and general exam. You've done your investigations. What do you do next? You're still evaluating the patient. It's the diagnostic workup for the patient. What do you do next?
Do you send the patient home? Management. Management, yes. So management can include both supportive and pharmacological. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me show you that slide. So this is how we go. You have to remember this, okay? Number one, take a thorough medical history. So if you're, to give, if you're given a question, a vignette, you can be asked, what's your diagnosis? And then you can be asked, um, provide the diagnostic workup for this patient. Then you're given like eight marks. So you'll be like, what do you mean eight marks? So this is what you're supposed to say. Take a thorough medical history perform a general and physical examination. So here in physical, we mean a systemic exam. Number three, you have to do tests. For lab tests, we have this complete blood count, UECs, TFTs, LFTs, all those tests that we have mentioned. Then we have microbiological tests, we culture, in case you're thinking there's an infection. Then you have specialized tests, which are like genetic testing, flow cytometry, immunological testing, you know, the immunological fluorescent assays, all those. Then you have imaging. Imaging, we have x-rays, CT scans, ultrasound, MRI, okay? Then number four, uh, sorry, I forgot to add it, but here should be management. So in management, we have both supportive and pharmacological management. Then number five, we have additional evaluation. So this one means you can refer the patient or consult with specialists. And then the last one is usually follow up. You monitor the patient closely and then you repeat tests if necessary. Okay. Let me edit for you guys here. So here is management. It can be supportive. Supportive means these ones like you do physiotherapy, uh, anything that involves not use of any drugs, pharmacological, and then additional evaluation, and then monitoring the patient closely, repeating tests if necessary. So these are the answers they expect you to say, okay? So if you're given a patient with pneumonia and you're told evaluate this patient, you do a thorough medical history, looking for the signs of pneumonia, so you have to mention them, perform a general and physical examination. Then you mention the signs you're going to get in the pneumonia patient. Do the lab test, give what you'll find, and then go to management if it's going to be supportive. You know, supportive can also include telling them, oh, um, avoid, for example, if an asthmatic, you tell them, avoid certain triggers. And then pharmacological, you tell them the drugs they should use. Then additional evaluation. So if, for example, they have, uh, they have something like community-acquired pneumonia and they have resistant bacteria. Let's say you've given them all the drugs, but it's still resistant. So you have to consult with the infectious disease specialist and then follow up the patient closely and then repeat tests if necessary, okay? So don't be shocked. You're told diagnostic workup for the patient, eight marks, and you have nothing to say. This is what you should say, okay? Yes, so I'm done. Is there any question?